Good afternoon, all, and welcome to Cowboys Corner. Let me get the right background up. Sorry about that. Uh, for this, uh, I guess, will be my first class that is not a gaming class. Uh, I am Lord Calberto Geiler, Companion of the Meridian Cross, Companion of the Argent Comic, Companion of the Argent Lamp, Osprey, and Reaper. Uh, coming to you live, as always, from the Baron of the Osprey on the southern coast of Meridiaes. I'm having all sorts of green screen issues, apparently, guys, so excuse that. I don't even know where it's at. Is it this one? Yeah, it's that one. Cool. There we go. Okay. Sorry. Technical difficulties. Um, all right. So this is so yeah. This is my first class that is not a gaming related class, um, and I want to both thank and apologize to the folks from Atlantia. Uh, so this class was just scheduled for yesterday morning at nine o'clock, uh, and I thought my time. Um, and when I went to bed the night before, I set my alarm and I pushed the eight thirty a.m. button and went happily to sleep. Unfortunately, the 8.30 a.m. button also had the weekday option selected, and Saturday is not a weekday, so the alarm didn't go off. Uh, so I got a message about 10 o'clock, waking me up, saying, hey, you're, uh, you missed your class. I'm like, oh, lovely. Oops. I feel like a jackass, but I'm here now. So I rescheduled it. Um, I hope people from Atlantia join. Uh, if you're there from Atlantia, thank you for, for rejoining. And, and I saw you guys had a lovely conversation in the uh, comments, so um, I'm glad that happened. I, I'm I'm terribly sorry I missed this class, um, and I hope today makes it up to you. Um, so I guess let's jump right into the topic, and uh, let's look at some things. So let me get my screen up here. Add a screen. Cool. So this is who are the Scythians? Um, and uh, some introductions first. Let me make sure. It's my first time doing a PowerPoint in StreamYard, so this may be a little, uh, little touchy, but we'll figure it out. There we go. All right, so uh, as I said, I am Lord Calbarter uh, from Osprey and Meridiaes. Um, this PowerPoint uh, is prepared by me, uh, and I'll go into some of the references here in a minute, uh, but also edited by my dear wife, Sifa. Um, she does all of my making things pretty and presentable. Uh, I am a very much a nuts and bolts kind of guy. She is the uh, the artist of the, uh, the household. Um, so a couple things about what this class is and isn't, uh, and sort of where I'm coming from from this. This is the first in a series. Um, it is part of my Magister's project for uh, ROM for Royal University of Meridiaes for Extra European. Uh, so I plan to do this class uh, and then four others that will be deep dives based off of this class. So this is the overview, sort of some general knowledge, some ideas, some, uh, some high-level stuff about what, who the Scythians were, and it's sort of the start of the research. Um, after this, I'm going to then break out into each of the topics and dive a little deeper into some more archaeological stuff, some more, uh, some more detail, the sort of 201, 301 level uh, information. So this is very much 101. This is very much uh, high level. Uh, now, all that being said, I am, I am a games guy for anybody who follows the channel. Uh, I am very much a, uh, like I said, nuts and bolts, like functionality. Um, so this is my first really uh, researchy class. Um, I'm not a real great researcher. I'm not a real great, uh, I'm, not a, uh, you know, I'm not a laurel, I'm not a doctoral kind of guy. Um, but I'm hoping to, to work on improving that a little bit. And this, uh, this class series is part of that. So let's talk about the Scythians. Uh, first, uh, usually I do references at the end, uh, but I think for this, because it is important to talk to know where I'm getting this information from, and a lot of the references I'm going to make are two, a uh, couple of things here. Uh, it's important to talk about up front. So there's two main sources, or really there's one main source in period for the Scythians. Um, and I'll explain why. So really, uh, the problem with the Scythians is they don't have a written, a written culture. Uh, and that's a, sort of your first fact. But this, this class is going to be a lot of just sort of facts and then explanation of facts um, uh, or opinions and explanation of opinions um, and sort of suppositions about the Scythians. Um, so Herodotus is a, was a writer. Um, he's a Greek writer. And he wrote extensively about the Scythians in period. He's the only uh, sort of concrete written work we had. There's another writer by the name of uh, Hippocrates or Pseudo-Hippocrates. It did some writing, but it was very uh, hit or miss and like wasn't really consistent. Um, so Herodotus is one of the only ones that's really uh, credited with with talking about the Scythians consistently. Um, he, has, he has a book series or sort of series of writings called the Histories, um, which I have around here. Oh, I do. Ah, Herodotus and Histories, um, and it's basically all his writings, and they're they're numbered um, with. And a lot of them about Scythians. He didn't write. He didn't write exclusively on Scythians, but a lot of them were. Um, and, we'll, and we'll get into some of when those writings came up uh, later in the slides. So a lot of the information we have that is the written works comes from Herodotus. Now, from a more contemporary perspective, uh, Barry Coonliffe uh, is a um, 
has probably the foremost book, I think, in my opinion, uh, on the Scythians currently. Uh, he is a British archaeologist and academic. Uh, he is the he was professor of European archaeology at Oxford from seventy two to two thousand seven, uh, and since two thousand seven he's been a, a professor emeritus there. Um, and basically, his his biggest focus is is Scythian works uh, and sort of those the cultures around that. He's he's not exclusive to Scythians, but uh, his book. Uh, oh look, I have it. Yeah. Oh, I have the dust jacket from it. So Scythians, uh, Nomad Warriors of the Steppe, great book. Um, I have it both in a hardback and in uh, an audiobook. I listen to audiobook uh, when I'm driving because it's helping get in the mindset and get in some of the, the work there. Um, it's not a real great book for um, for quick research because um, he wrote it uh, very conversationally, which I, I, I appreciate. It makes it easier to listen to. It's not a textbook at all, um, but it's very conversational, to tell you just sort of stories and things like that. Um, Whereas a lot of Herodotus stuff, and a lot of the, a lot of our conversational, same thing with Herodotus thing, writing as well, um, is a lot of his are conversational because he's just writing about what he saw. Um, so something about Herodotus here in his writings. Uh, so he traveled the Black Sea. Uh, the Gib, I, I'm going to probably butcher a lot of the words because a lot of them are in languages I don't speak. Um, so the Black Sea, the Nipper River, heartland of the Scythians, the sort of the area around that. We'll, I'll show the map in a little bit um, from 450-ish BC. Um, he reached Olbia, which is about 40 miles west of the Dnieper River. Um, and there's a, like I said, I've got a map here in a minute. I think I'll show you that. Um, so think about Herodotus. And this is, so this, so this is the important thing to remember about this, about this whole thing. And a lot of things about the Scythians. Because we don't have any writings from the Scythians themselves, everything we read about them that is written is written from a biased perspective. And that's important to remember because a lot of, so Scythians were a, were a, um, a, a, a pagan, so a non-Christian, non-Judaic, you know, so thing, and they were they were essentially they were they were barbarians to these people to to the Greeks at the time, um, because the Greeks time were pagans. So let me, let me clarify that. But they they were the they were the they were the non they were the minority at this point, and they were the barbarians. They were savage people. They were, um, you know, yeah, yeah. Herodotus called the father of lies. Um, he was the so they were they were the 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 other. Um, so everything Herodotus spoke of was from that bias, and he put a lot of a lot of the works he he wrote were from his perspective. I mean, it makes sense; he wrote from his perspective. So a lot of you have to take with a grain of salt. Now, um, and, and he gave them a, a sort of a, a, an unjustified bad rap, probably um, because he talked about a lot of their atrocities, a lot of things they did wrong. But if you look at the Romans, the Persians, the Egyptians, or the, even the Greeks. Um, you know, they, they, they had their own atrocities amongst them. So you kind of take it all, uh, as you will. Uh, but a lot of the stuff he talks about, we have now sort of confirmed via grave goods or, uh, or other finds. Um, so it's, you know, it's interesting to see, see some of it play out. So you can trust it somewhat, um, so, so that's it. So I say all that because that, that's my two main sources for this. Uh, I pull a lot of other references from other websites and other other sort of studies and archaeological finds and, and kids that here and there. And I've referenced some of them. Um, this is not a real deep dive. This like this is very high level. Uh, but that's my two main sources. And then I sort of branched out for some like pictures and other little tidbits here and there. All right. So let's look at some of the archaeology. Um, so a lot of what we know about the Scythians that is more concrete is from the archaeological digs. So they you have two sets of archaeology. There's ancient archaeology and there's modern archaeology. Um, and, I, and I say ancient archaeology is sort of air quotes, and that's anything that is in the first set of digs, which is in the 1800s. Uh, so the earliest archaeological dig was, uh, or the findings were in the 18th century. Uh, so that late, so late 1700s actually, uh, from Nicholas Whitson, uh, Nicholas Cornelius Whitson, Whitson. Um, so he. We don't know if he did the dig himself, but he ended up with two uh, sets of objects. Or see, he received two consignments of objects uh, in early 1700s, 1714 and 1716, um, consisting of 40 gold articles, uh, which was neck rings, belt plaques, animal motif ornaments, um, a lot of things, we, a lot of the gold work we see. And that was the first documented Scythian finds. Um, now, unfortunately, these articles uh, only survive now in his book, the Nordic and those Tartarte, uh, which if you try to Google that, you will either find Nordic things 
or beef tartar. So be very careful how you spell it. Um, but uh, that's the, was a funny Googling when I was trying to find a, a good picture for his book there. Um, and it's, yeah, it's on the screen. So if you want to Google that yourself, you can do that. Um, uh, but unfortunately, after that book was written uh, and after Whitson died in uh, 1717, all of the, the, uh, the, the goods were melted down. Are uh, sold off and, and, and are lost. Most of them were melted down and, and uh, sold for their gold value, which just makes me tear up when I think about it because that's, you know, it was, it was 40 objects. It was, wasn't a, a lot, but from a culture that no longer exists, that's a lot. Uh, a little while later, uh, Nikita, Nikita Demidov, uh, he presented the Empress Catherine um, with precious gold objects from Siberian tombs. Um, sort of giant air quotes there because you guys do the go with this. Um, so this is plus some, about 100 pieces that were relayed from Prince Gagarin, or Gagarin at the time. Uh, and that formed the foundation of what is now the, uh, the collection that's held by the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. Um, so that gift or those, those, that collection of items inspired Catherine the Great, Catherine, to order a systemic study of the works um, of where they found them. Unfortunately, that systemic study led to a full-scale ransacking of the Gurgans uh, by Gray Roberts and Brigands and whatnot. Um, at the time, that we didn't have, there were not laws saying you could or couldn't, or if they were, they weren't being well enforced. Um, so when when the, the Queen of time or whoever was in charge said, "Oh man, I really wish we had more of this stuff," and I'm ordering a study, she had her people going out, but also had anybody else who had a shovel going out and trying to dig up places. So. Uh, who knows what we've lost, but um, there are still some, un we're, we're still undisturbed, uh, some undisturbed. Uh, so that's the ancient archaeology. Now let's look toward modern archaeology. So to the, uh, and modern archaeology has changed even from uh, 20 years ago to now. It's, it's a significantly different thing. Anybody who watched Time Team uh, will see the changes in archaeology uh, from, now, from, from the start of the show until, until now. But uh, it's... Uh, Still a lot better than just some dudes with a shovel. So, all right. So one of the first sites that was discovered uh, was the Pazarat Kurgan, uh, which we see here uh, in the, the slide, or at least a, a rendering of it. Uh, and this is the Uligan district of the Altai Republic, south of no Nova Sibirik. Getting better. Um, so this consisted of five large barrel mounds and several smaller barrel mounds. So all of the uh, and we'll, we'll I think I think I'll get a picture of the Kurgans later. Um, if not, that'll be one of my deep dives. Uh, so basically, all the Scythians buried uh, their their dead in kurgans or in barrel mounds. Um, they would they would either dig out an area, uh, place the body, place the grave with, and then build over it uh, or, or bury over it. Sometimes they were in uh, rooms. Sometimes they were just buried over. Um, usually there was a, but it was always a mound. Um, some interesting uh, to kind of dive off into that subject for just a second. Some interesting thing that I, I found that I thought was a really cool thing is they would often bring in. Uh, sod or dirt uh, or or soil and grass from many kilometers away, uh, and the idea I think is sort of what we the civilization was was they were actually uh, as part of the grave goods were presenting that king that ruler that important person with with their with their land with their fields, um, and because of the distance traveled they, they've uh, they've they've dated or. Uh, I don't know how you date dirt, but they, they check the dirt soil, the sort of the soil samples from the from the Kurgans and where in Roz it didn't it wasn't local dirt, it wasn't local sod. Um, so it clearly came from somewhere other region, which I, I think that, that's kind of cool that uh, so not only did they have grave goods in the grave itself, uh, but it also can, the the grave was consistent was constructed of grave goods essentially. Um, so that that first uh, Pazrat Kurgan was was found in a, or was was archaeology or, or, or was dug, I guess, uh, between 1925 and 1949. So we're talking, we're talking early to mid 1950s. Um, the next one was found in the 1990s uh, in the village of uh, Aranishkova, uh, which is uh, modern Ukraine, about 75 miles south of Kiev. Um, the neat thing was that uh, that second Kurgan they found was one of the few unlooted tombs of any Scyth Scythian chieftain. Um, so, so there are many of the Kurgans we find have been looted, have been disturbed. Um, the, the good thing is people that were looting took the gold, but didn't take the bodies, didn't take the clothes, didn't take the horses, didn't take a lot of the, the tack that was there. 
Uh, so we do still have a lot of the grave goods that were not precious metals. Um, and we can sort of tell where some of the great precious metals were. And also the ones that were disturbed, some of them they disturbed one room, but not, they didn't dig in all of it. Uh, the Kurgans were often, were often in uh, pods um, or you know, room connected rooms or like the Egyptian temples. Um, so you had pieces. So not all of them were disturbed. A lot of them, you know, pieces and parts were disturbed. All right. So that's where we, so that's the information. So, we're, so we have Herodotus, we have Barry Coonliff. Um, there's actually, there's a new book coming out uh, or a new set of books coming out uh, or set of writings, I guess. Uh, hopefully, I think in a couple of months here that I'm on my wish list right now, that is going to be a lot of are the studies of the digs and it's sort of in-depth details of the digs and people that wrote about them and what they saw and sort of sort of uh, first-hand knowledge. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to getting my hands on that because it's um, right now there's a whole lot of information out there that's, that's pretty drastically varying. Um, I found one website that was Scythian conspiracy theories, for lack of a better term. Um, it was entertaining but scary all right so we talked about where, where i'm getting information from let's talk about the information so first up is culture and lifestyle um so scythians were so they oh God, so they, they were considered a group because of the customs and traditions and sort of generalized um approach to life um but they weren't actually one group they were they were they were multiple tribes there were multiple small tribes and not really connected necessarily um so Scythians also have multiple names um in throughout history you'll see Scythians, Saka um got these listed here hold on are they my first time using this noting system so my notes are kind of wacky so give me a moment Nope. Okay. Um, oh yeah. So it is. Um, so yeah, Scythian, Saka, uh, Barbarian. Um, later in later in period, uh, later in the 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 nine hundred. So nine hundred to one hundred BC is the Scythian time. Um, nine hundred to four hundred, depending on who you talk to. Um, but later in that period of time, Scythian became the generic word for barbarian. Um, just like we use sort of uh, you know, pagan as a generic word for non-Christian. Same same idea. Um, it became a generic word for any barbarian, which means that there may have been people that were called Scythians in writings. They were not actually Scythian by, by actual culture. Um, like the, the Saka people uh, or Sarmatians uh, may have been also called Scythians. You, you, you honestly could have had Mongolians that were called Scythians because they would have been very similar later in that period when Mongolians were becoming more of a thing. Um, now, uh, the Scythians themselves, uh, I said, so they were they were a, a sort of a, a group of disparate people. They were, they were an autonomous collective, as it were. Uh, they were nomads. They were pastoral nomads. Um, reading Vikings comment. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll, get, I'll, I'll do that in a second. Okay. So Scythians were nomads. They were pastoral nomads specifically. So, so they dealt in. Uh, they moved from place to place. They didn't really have permanent settlements until much later in period. I don't have a good documentation for that, but I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so they were, they were skilled with the horse. They were skilled in archery. And, and much of their culture centered around the horse. And this is important because not only does their culture center around the horse, but also their warfare centered around the horse. And we'll get yeah, that in future slides. Um, but they, they raised livestock. Um, so they, they dealt in, in sheep, um, yaks, cows, that sort of thing. Um, we don't have the exact details of their animals, but anything that they had, it was a, a pasture animal because um, they could move them. So, you know, they weren't restricted to one location. They could move the animals with them as they moved. Um, but horses were their primary. Um, basically, I'd like say, you know, they were Mongolians before the Mongolians were cool. Um, and, you know, because they had wagons, which they did, by the way, they had wagons, which I thought, which I think is a really cool thing. This is 900 BC and they've got, you know, functional wagons. Um, they were actually the Romani travelers before the Romani travelers were cool. Um, which, so Mongolians were my travelers, two of my favorite subjects, how I got into Scythians, uh, as I, I really wanted to research both of those sayings, and I was like, oh, look, Scythians, they're, they're both. Um, a couple of other facts here. So generally, the Scythians were egalitarian. Uh, they were very much, um, and we see this later reflected in a uh, Mongolian lifestyle as well, um, that women were very much equivalent um, and were 
and I say equal with sort of down air quotes. We, we, we're, we're making suppositions based on anecdotal evidence. So a lot of this is anecdotal uh, based on Herodotus' writings or based on um, sort of uh, the cultures around it. But the women were, were equal in that they were expected to be warriors. They were expected to uh, part of the heart of life. They had skills same as the men. Um, now, it was still a, a patriarchal society because they, they did have kings. And we'll talk about some of the kings in a little bit here. Um, but, uh, the, uh, but their pantheon was, was matriarchal, which is really interesting. Um, uh, so like I said, there's, the women are expected to be warriors and there are mentions in a few of the, uh, the writings that a woman was actually not allowed to wed until she made her first kill in battle and legend tells, and you know, John here quotes legend tells any, anything, um, my friends that do, uh, Chinese and Japanese studies, anything, if it says legend tells, just throw it out the window. It's usually trash. Um, but it's always interesting to look at. So legend tells that actually women would, would even shear off one of their breasts so they could fire their bows better because they were a horse fielder because they were a bow people that would get in the way. Uh, anybody who has, who has breasts that has ever fired a bow is can attest to that, I'm sure. Um, so, but the idea, so we, I mentioned that women were equal and they're not right there. It was a rule saying that they can't get married until they're, until they're taking their first kill. Um, so we, if that rule was sort of applicable across the board, cool. I, I, I can, I can buy that. Um, and the idea was that the men were usually the one out fighting. The women would as well. And once they had their, once women had their first kill, they could then retire, retire and go be women and do, you know, the child birthing and, and sort of more family stuff. Um, you know, uh, and there's stuff in some of their, uh, mythology and some of the, uh, the priesthood stuff that we'll talk about instead with some other interesting gender things. Um, I, I basically saying that I think there was, there, they were very egalitarian in that I think uh, all of them were equivalent, uh, but I don't know that they were as egalitarian as we maybe would expect them to be today, but still better than like, the, than some of the other cultures were. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. So a couple things from this slide specifically. So these are some slides here, uh, some pictures of some of their clothing. Um, so it's very similar to a lot of the Mongolian stuff we see. Uh, a lot of the um, the uh, the Greeks and Romans stuff, um, but also they were colder, so a lot of the stuff is thicker. Um, we'll, we'll look at some of the trade in a little bit here. They traded with the Greeks, they traded with the Romans, they traded with uh, the Silk Road, the Asian. It was you know, being in the middle, being sort of the middle of the uh, from Europe to Asia. Um, they had a lot of trade opportunities and because they moved around. They traded a lot. Um, so their, their, their clothing and their, and their style was very, was, was varied, uh, pretty drastically. Um, and that's right. That's correct. Uh, uh Kayla mentions there that many cultures had, uh, before Christianity took over, had female gods of war. You're correct there. Um, uh, Scythians did not, and like I said, we'll, we'll hit the mythology here in a moment. Um, but the, uh, the painting in the middle here is actually, particularly, uh, I have a note from that. This, uh, this is called the Ovid Among the Scythians. That's a painting by Eugene Delacroix from the 1859. Um, just showing some of the their, I guess, lifestyle there. Uh, so the Scythians were Indo-Iranian. Um, so these are very, a lot of this, the paintings we see, a lot of pictures we see are very white people. Uh, um, but Scythians were, would have been very dark skinned. Um, so Iranian, that, you know, the the olive uh, or dark olive skinned people. Um, but they were further north. So they would have been lighter than, say, Egyptian would have been. Um, light, lighter skinned generally because of their, uh, their distance to the equator. Uh, again, we're guessing a lot of that because of uh, we don't have the skin color from from burial mounds. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so there were, uh, as I mentioned, there were multiple groups of the Scythians, um, not defined, but there were multiple Scythian tribes, you could call them, um, and, and they didn't have really have any kind of area, but um, most of the Scythians lived in the area surrounded by the Danube River uh, in Mongolia and, and down to the, the Iranian Plateau. Um, so there's sort of an area, I think I've got, I hope, I hope I've got the map here in a minute, um, that shows sort of the general area. But because they had no permanent settlements and they had no sort of long-standing areas, they were, it's really hard to say they lived here. Um, I did find some anecdotal evidence um, in my, in preparation of this class, I looked for some pictures that towards the end of their, um, the, the the dynasties uh, of the Scythian culture, 
they get started settling down and building uh, some some more permanent niche settlements, uh, which allowed them to have workshops and do some more crafting things, um, which I can believe. I can believe that happened. I can believe that it probably did happen even in period, uh, even in, in Scythian period. Um, and it, it's it's interesting because we, we're comparing um, a non-written culture to written cultures. If we had a, a Scythian group that moved, for instance, for, across the, the Caucasus Mountains, into the Ukraine, into uh, Romania, those areas, and integrated into that culture because they could have. If you know, they got they 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 went over and got stuck because you know the past freezed over or whatever, they couldn't get back. I mean, just live there. Um, and that group then no longer was Scythian; they would have been integrated into that population. Um, but they brought their culture with them. So I'm actually working on a. I have a uh, a goal of mine is to prove that Scythians influence both the Mongolians and the, and the Romanians. And the, the part of the culture went both directions because a lot of the things they have, the Scythian bows, the Scythian wagons, show up in other cultures. And some of the lifestyle things show up in both cultures. Um, and the idea of where the Romani travelers came from, uh, that, that culture coming from Egypt, um, there are some things later in the Scythian thing, uh, later in the Scythian timeline, where they actually moved down into uh, the, that, the Punjab Peninsula or, 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 or Upper Egypt um, and then came back up which would have been where a lot of the Romani traveler culture came from initially um, is from that area. Um, so, you know, there, there's some, there's some really anecdotal evidence that I'm working through. Um, so stay tuned. All right. So we can't talk about Scythians without talking about warfare. They were a war people. Um, so let's look at arms and armor first, and then we'll get into some of their, uh, their tactics and things. So I thought it was really interesting about Scythians from a warfare perspective, is because they did not have um, a place. They didn't have a, a they didn't have permanent settlement. They had nothing to defend. Um, so if they didn't want to fight you, they wouldn't fight you. They would just leave. And because they were on horses, they could leave faster than you could. Um, and generally, much easier. Um, and they were always moving, so they, there was really no way to, to cement them down. Um, so that's interesting, and we'll, we'll talk more about that when we get into the strategy uh, and tactics here in just a second. Um, so this is a, um, a reproduction of a set of armor um, and some weapons and things. So Scythians use spears, battle axes, uh, iron and bronze swords, uh, composite bows, which is, the I think, the most important part, arrows with iron or bronze or even bone arrowheads. Um, and think, the interesting thing about the arrows is they didn't have just a single arrow. They, I mean, they had multiple, obviously, you know, they carried hundreds at a time. But they were varied in purpose. So they had, you know, arrows for hunting, arrows for killing, arrows for, for this and that. Um, even so far as using ones that were poisoned um, and, and things of that nature. Um, so they were they were skilled with the bow. And these were these were composite bows. These were the earliest, some of the earliest composite bows we've seen. Um, so they were short, easy for horseback, um, using them out of bone or a wooden bone. Um, but it allowed them to be mobile. And, and being on a horse. With, with, a, with a firearm, essentially, against people who were not, means you win. It means, it means you are a spirit force at this point. Um, so the, the, the neat thing about it is they were able to run in, volley arrows, turn around and volley arrows on the way out before the, and, and the, and the, other, the other army couldn't attack. They, 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 they were literally you know, standing there with their, with their spears in their hands. Um, um, so as far as the actual, so, so some of the looking at the bows, uh, there have only been two Scythian bows that have been on Earth. Um, one was 32 inches long and was double curved, like the Greek letter sigma. So it's a so it curves, curves, and then curves again. So it's the, the composite idea. Um, it was laminated, made of strips of willow and alder, and joined with fish glue. Um, you know, ri the river was there. That would have been their most uh, easily accessible glue. Um, so according to the inscription of the, black, uh, the Greek Black Sea, uh, trading town of Obia, uh, one of these bows could fire an arrow 570 yards, which is over half a kilometer. So that's five and a half or roughly five and a half football fields. That's a pretty good shot. Um, I, I don't know. I'm not an expert in English longbow, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, would, would beat an English longbow if I'm not mistaken. I, I could be wrong on that. But uh, that's a pretty good shot for a wasn't a very, you know, 32 centimeters. Not, it's not a very large, a large bow. Um, the warriors would carry up to 200 needle-sharp arrows into battle. Uh, some were poisoned. Um, 
There's a, uh, Ovid describes a poisonous juice uh, brewed from a mixture of snake venom, purified blood, and dung um, that clings to flying metal. So it's, it was basically, they, they poison their arrows with, with, with venom, blood, and poop. So the thing about that is if the arrow didn't kill you, the disease would, or the poison would. Um, if the, the snake venom didn't get you, the blood and the, and the, and the dung would. Um, so it was very difficult, uh, very fierce warriors. Quick Google search from Viking says English longbow had an effective range of 350 yards. So there, there you go. So even so, an effective range of 350, um, probably a top range of, probably it's, it's pretty close, then, probably 500 yards at, at a top range. Um, but effective of 350, I would assume their, their effective range was not 570. Um, but, you know, again, mobility, you didn't need a large effective range. But 570 is a pretty good, a pretty good shot. Um, so this picture here, you see there's a, on his hip, there is a, uh, what they call a Gorthos, which is a combination bow and arrow holder. So that right there actually shows how big the bow is. So this is three of these guys, you know, six foot, you know, five and a half foot, six foot tall. Um, so that's a, not a very large bow would fit in that holder there. Um, their armor consisted of bronze or iron scales, usually sewn into leather. Um, so these scales were, were some of them were lamellar like, uh, like we'd see in the in Asian armors. Some of them were scales, uh, like fish scales. Um, so they're all rounded down, pointing downward, uh, like we'd see in like modern scale mail. Um, and sometimes they had both in one set of armor. So this guy always is mostly wearing lamellar, uh, laced like a, in a Mongolian sort of style. Um, we see some of the. Uh, some of the other, some of the more, uh, the well-to-do Scythians will have a uh, scale like the, uh, like the Greek, uh, the Greek scale. Uh, so they also, so, so the, uh, obviously their armor was that they had arrows and spears, uh, that were flexible and relatively lightweight. Um, so they had, so they could, they could shoot the arrow, they could throw the spears, they could stab the spears. The spears were about their height, you know, six, seven feet tall. Um, the, uh, the nobles, the, the more well-to-do's, would have uh, hammered golden helmets and headdresses. So you see a lot of really tall headdresses, a lot of tall hats. Um, one of the things in, in Scythian art that you see a lot is their, uh, all of their hats I mean, were, were like pointed, but usually like curved in some way like that. Um, so anybody who knows anything about hats, uh, they were variations of the Phrygian cap, which is, uh, or later becomes the, the French Liberty cap. Um, it's a variation of this hat as well. Um, but uh, because of what they made it of and, and where they were by the thickness, it, it stood up. And the thing, if you're looking at any art, if you ever see somebody with a, with a pointed hat or a slightly curved tall hat in this time frame, it's probably a Scythian. Because uh, that was the thing they, they seem to be the most common throughout their, uh, their art and people seeing them. Um, that um, when people depicted the Scythians, it was always it was their hats they saw. Which I, which I think is a, it's a cool feature. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of hats. Um, hats were one of my, that, that'll be my apparel arts focus in a little bit here is, is doing a, a series, series on hats. Um, but the, uh, the, the nobles were hammered gold helmets, headdresses, decorative gold scabbards. Um, obviously, you know, and, and we're basing off, off grave goods. And I always like to tell people when I'm, when I talk about grave goods, that grave goods are what they wore to church and what the, you know, it was what their church clothes were. It was their best stuff. So they may not have been wearing this stuff in a battle every day. Some of it, you know, gold stuff is not functional necessarily. Um, but um, some of it you could be made functional or at least be prettier if, if you were the, the Scythian kings or uh, chieftains or whatever. Um, to next. Uh, so horse archers, we mentioned that. Um, so being archers, being on horseback, um, other armies time depended mostly on foot soldiers. There were, you know, they had some chariots and they had some horsemen, uh, but I think the the Scythian was a, a, a two to one ratio, whereas most other armies like three, four to one, five to one ratio maybe of um, of foot to, to uh, more foot than cavalry. And Scythians were were two to one horse to man. Um, you know, not everybody fought on horseback, but most of them did. Uh, so between the amount of horses, the volley of arrows, and their tattoos, uh, and this is a culture thing I, that I, I want to, I'm going to hopefully deep dive into the tattoos specifically. Um, they were they they were Pictish people. They were they were they were painted. Um, they were full body tattoos. Um, 
that seem to have cultural significance to them, seem to have religious significance to them. Um, it's hard to tell because it's a, you know, again, no documentation of it, but a lot of them were animal based, um, animal motifs. Um, so it was probably some sort of cultural thing of, of warrior spirit decorated themselves with animals, uh, but it made them fierce looking. Uh, it made them, you know, imagine a, a band of screaming, you know, Screaming angry Scythians, you know, running at you on horseback at full gallop, firing arrows, covered in tattoos with giant gold helmets on. Like, that's just terrifying. I love it, but it's terrifying. Um, you know, so even if the even if the opposing force didn't run away, uh, the Scythians proved an intimidating force. And, and if they didn't run immediately, it still was a definitely would have some people shaking. And the idea that they, they appeared and disappeared. So they would run in, run out, run in, run out. And they'd attack and then leave. Um, so they were not they were not a stubborn people. They, they would they would get in, do their, do their damage, grab their thing and go. And then come back the next day and do it again. Um, so so they, they definitely took advantage of their military uh, resources and in, in their, in their mobility and um, their tactics. Um, talk about that, talk about that. Uh, so looking at it, so, so not only do we have biological warfare with the poisons, um, you have guerrilla warfare, you know, being, being attack and retreat, attack and retreat. This was, this was not the, the British ideal of two armies standing off and just do, 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 you know, it was, it was the hit and it was a hit and run. It was like very much like, like Patriot from the Revolutionary War. It was, um, they were guerrilla warfare at, at you know, at an early time. Um, and because they were nomadic, they, they had, they had no advantage, uh, you know, they could, they could basically run in, kill everything and then leave and didn't care. They had other places they could go, you know, so if you, or, or if you attack them, they'd be like, all right, bye, and just leave. There's nothing keeping them in any place. Uh, now this, uh, as I know, this did change later in, in period when they had started having more of the Kurgans than the barrel mounds. Um, pardon my French, but I, I, uh, I attribute their barrel mounds to the, we don't have much, but these are ours, and fuck around and find out. Uh, so it was it was the one thing that we've fa- we've seen that the Scythians cared about, and it was you didn't mess with their dead, you didn't mess with their Kurgans. Um, they wouldn't necessarily defend them; they wouldn't be you know, hanging out, living with them. Um, but if they saw somebody moving through, or or you know heard a disruption or whatever, they it was a it was a, it, definitely a slight that they did not uh, did not afford. From you know again anecdotal evidence. Um, do 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 do. We don't have forty. Ooh, forty two minutes. Wow. All right. Okay. Cool. All right. So let's move on. Let's look at some trade and geography. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll go back for a second. I want to look at the. So uh, mention some armor here. So a lot of the armor you see, uh, most of this is plates. Um, the belts you see, a lot of them have belts on that are that are plated belts. That's a fairly common thing. Uh, it, it's ubiquitous across most Scythians we've seen is that that particular style of belt. I'm actually recreating one currently. Uh, notice the helmets uh, range in, in style from uh, Asian to Greek. Uh, they, again, they, again, they traded both directions and they wildly ranging uh, styles of, of armor. All right, so trade and geography. So because the Scythians moved so much and traded so much, they, 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 there was a wide range of things. I'm going to show a couple maps here. A whole lot of details about this because it's so very nice. I'll, hopefully, I'll deep dive on this a little bit later. Um, but here's a couple of maps of the Scythian region. We we'll consider the Scythian region. One of the map is the uh, the Greek trade routes. So this shows the Persian Empire. Oh, I'm pointing my finger like you guys can see that. Um, so this shows the Persian Empire here. Um, so these are Scythian invasion routes. The yellow is when the Scythians are coming down. So I, as you watch here, so this is the. Uh, this route, nope, that's not showing up on my thing. Hold on just a second. Let me get my pointer out. There we go. Uh, so this route here is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the Scythians leaving. So um, late in period, uh, the 200, 100, that 400, 400 region, uh, Alexander the Great uh, came across and said, Scythians die and, and push them from here across. And they said, okay, cool. And a lot of them went down into Persia, and into Mesopotamia, into Palestine, into Egypt. So this group here is the one I, that I'm actually most, most interested in that went into Egypt because a group from Egypt and from this general the, the this area ended up coming up into what became you know what is Romania in that area. Um, so that, that's a some some interesting. I want to see I want to see where that group went. Uh, it's hard because it, they integrated in the culture. We see a lot of that. So 
um, both directions, but also a group that went straight across into what is now like you know, Mongolia and, and uh, China in that area. Um, here's on the right here, these are markings of some of the uh, the Kurgans and the sort of the burial areas. Uh, so you see Obia, Tiras, and there's some of the cities and areas. Um, um, so you can see concentration of their burials, but uh, and then Kiev up there, but not. Uh, um, it's not necessarily where they stay, sort of it's where they where they could bury things and, and were able to leave stuff. Um, yeah, so looking at the Black Sea, essentially, um, you see Athens and Thrace over here. Uh, that gives you an idea of, of sort of where we are in the world as far as uh, the Grecian culture was, was concerned, Thracian culture. So let me find my notes back. Give me moments. Here we go. All right, mythology. So uh, a lot of cultures base or, or their biggest influence is, is, is deities and epic influences in, in, in the mythos. So I always like to look into those because I think that's a thing we can compare the most. Um, the caveats for... Oh, where are my notes? Well, that's not good. Neat, my notes are missing. All right, just give me two moments. Let me pull my notes up. So I've made the transition to the slide. Um, so a lot of the, the things we see from mythology is based from Herodotus's writings, right? Um, so so we have to take that with the, with the grain of salt because it's all based off of Grecian myth and what he translated. Now he did keep a lot of the original names, but he compared them to Greek and Greek to, to the Greek gods of time. So I'll tell you a couple stories and we'll, then we'll go from there. So there are two main creation myths um, that actually tie together in the time of their deific pantheon. Um, so the deific pantheon first had was considered a three rank system, and it's similar to the uh, the, the 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 gods of Olympus when they were you know you have the, the head god and then sort of the people that were more in charge and then the the, the others. Um, it, it's similar if you look at the Catholic culture um, with you you know. Um, God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost thing, Mary, the more important than all the saints. It's a similar idea. Um, you see a lot of those sort of stacked or ranked uh, deific uh, settings. All right. And I can't see comments right now. So so if you comment or anything, say just uh, I'll get to you back in a second. Um, so at the top of the rank was Tabidi uh, or uh, Greek Hestia. Uh, she was the flaming goddess of heat, fire, and the hearth. So hearths or hearts, fires, camps are, are important uh, in most cultures. Um, so having a, uh, a fire god at the top, or in this case, fire goddess at the top, uh, is, is not uncommon. Uh, in the second rank, you had Papaeus and Apia, or Apia, uh, so Zeus and Gaia. These are the father and mother of the universe and are considered polar opposites. So Gaia being the mother earth uh, and Zeus being, or Papias being the, uh, the sky father. Um, and that's, so it sort of shows the balance of life. You had uh, Tabiti being the hearth in the center uh, of the world or the, or the sun in this case. Um, and then you had the, the earth and the sky being your, uh, your second rank. And your third rank is everybody else. Uh, so there were five uh, main deific figures. Um, there could have been more. Arodas only mentions five in most of his writings, and we and we don't see a whole lot. Of, like it's hard to identify what you're looking at in a lot of the the paintings and artwork and stuff. Um, so there's uh, Go to Cyrus, uh, which is their version of Apollo, um, uh, Argum Pasa or Aphrodite, and then there were two others. I'm sorry, there's sort of four, not five. There were two others that were they were equivalent to what we would know as Hercules and, and uh, Ares, um, but did not have uh, firm names. But kind of did. Um, so, Scythian Hercules, uh, or what may have been known as Targeti Targetios, and we'll talk about him in a second, is the progenitor of the Scythian kings. Um, Ares is the god of war and is venerated in an ancient sword. Um, Gotrosios is a more enigmatic uh, and probably associated with the sun. So, I would guess something probably similar to, to like a Mercury um, as well. It has some of those Mercury Apollo uh, traits. It was the the flashy, pretty, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the big, uh, you know, big important person. Yes, yeah, look at me, I'm pretty. That, that sort of uh, Apollo-looking thing. Um, and then a Grimpasa, which is fertility, abundance, uh, power over sovereignty, and the priestly force. 
Um, so Aphrodite, or Agrippas in this case, was the in charge of the priests. Uh, interesting note about their priesthood. Uh, they considered people that were transgender, uh, or uh, they had another word for it, but th that culture, to be holy people, actually. It was to them a special power. Uh, it was the uh, being uh, of two worlds kind of thing. And most of them were were, uh, were priests or considered uh, shamans. I think it's really interesting. I, I think that's a cool thing. And they, were, they were venerated, actually. Um... So there are a couple of uh, pieces here. We're talking about some of the, the creation myths. So the two creation myths that I, that I really I think are really um, actually connecting, connecting to their, their pantheon. So the countryside started as a desert. Um, Targetios was who was born, whose mother was the daughter of the river Borsenthesis, and his father was the god Zeus. So in this case, you can always look at it as Guy and Zeus uh, having uh, Targetios, Hercules. Um, Targetios sired three sons. Uh, Leopoxus, Arapaxus, and Calaxus, each who ruled a different part of the kingdom of Scythia. Kingdom of Scythia. Um, one day, four gold objects fell from the sky: a plow, a yoke, a battle axe, and a drinking cup. So this is a plow for the field, a yoke for the animals, a battle axe for war, and a drinking cup for 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 fun for culture. Um, each of the brothers approached these in order. Um, and was met with flames. So couldn't couldn't approach. Oh God, back up. Until Calaxus uh, approached and flames died down. He was able to claim them and became the first high king or the king of the royal Scythians. So this sets the precedence for the Scythians having three kings. Um, and we'll look at the dynasties here in a minute. But there were always three kings: um, a high king and two others. Um, how these were decided, how they got picked, how they decided who the high king was, eh, we don't know yet. I don't know yet. Um, but there was always a, uh, there was always that three kings because of this myth. Um, the second myth, uh, I think is a, sort of connects into that. And it's favored by the Greeks of the Black Sea. It's one of the, one of the, I guess one of their favorites. Uh, was Hercules was leading a group of cows uh, into the desert that was to become Scythia. So this would have been pre the, uh, this previous story. Um, uh, one night he fell asleep, and the mares that had pulled the chariot were stolen. His his horses had been stolen by the mistress of the country, uh, who was a, qua a cave dwelling creature, uh, human female upper and snake lower half. Um, Hercules approached her and asked her to return the animals, and she agreed if he would sleep with her. Well, he did, because uh, you know, Greeks would sleep with anything at the time, uh, or at least the Greek gods would. Uh, and the result of that union was. Agathyrus, Galonius, and Siths. Um, so Hercules left the children with the, with the mistress, and when asked what to do with them, she, he's leaving. She, she's like, well, what do I do with these kids? Uh, Hercules left her with instructions on how to string a bow and how to tie, how to tie a girdle. Uh, and instructed her to test each of the boys when they were ready. Um, so that happened, and each of the boys was tested, and only Siths succeeded. And from him descended the Scythian kings. Um, so that's interesting. So, so that's two, two ways to see the, uh, the the where the Scythian kings come from. I, I like the first one personally because it's the shows the three kings, um, and the idea of things falling from heaven, being star stuff falling is it, kind of a cool way to look at the myth. All right, I close that back down so I can get back to my slides here. Cool. Uh, so uh, on the slide here, we have a couple of things. Um, so this, the top one is uh, Tabiti, or we assume Tabiti. A lot of times she's, she's depicted as uh, having snakes coming out of her, which I think ties into the for that, that second creation myth, um, being the mother of the, you know, the one of the mother goddesses. You also can see her as Gaia, um, and being Mother Earth. So sort of a, a dual part there. Um, and then the two bottom ones, um, Sifa found these, and, and she thinks, you know, she's like, oh, these could be this, and she's probably, she could be right. A lot, a lot of the gulps that we see is either animal motifs, or it could be, you know, uh, um, mythology-related. Uh, I think it's interesting looking at the one on the right, seeing it's an eight-legged horse, looking at Viking things with Slepnir and the, uh, the eight-legged horse of that. Um, but it's actually not an eight-legged horse, actually it's two four-legged horses. Um, but it looks like an eight-legged horse when you first look at it, so it's kind of funny. Um, but the uh, one on the right could be uh, a relation to um, 
the Hercules and uh, the stealing of the mares story um, and, and having the sons. Um, and there's a tree reference back. You see a lot of trees, a lot of vines. Uh, tree of life is a thing. You see a lot in, in, a, uh, in Scythian culture, um, which I think is interesting because you, you see that tree of life pop up uh, a lot of things. Um, they had in, some influence from uh, the Buddhists as well at the time because of where they were. Um, later in that period, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, not Tibetan, uh, Oh, I'm failing. Anyways, there, there was one of the, one of the, because of when uh, when Gautama Buddha was around, it it was there. Um, so there's some of that. You'll you'll see the Scythian wheels um, pop up a lot as well. Um, and then she thinks the one on the right was actually the three brothers uh, engaging in warfare or engaging in a fight over the uh, the artifacts. Uh, eh, I can I can somewhat believe that, but uh, I think it's just a it's a fight because she's in shield type. So I think there's two different shield types that were that were show, shown. Uh, um, it could have also just been multiple Scythians attacking one dude because there's one dude really getting beat down here. All right, that's all the fun stuff. Let's get into some of the, the nitty gritty. Uh, so we have a couple of things with lines of ascension, then we're going to look at uh, a sort of timeline, and then we are done for the day. Um, I am not going to read this. This is this is uh, there's a rule in PowerPoint that you don't put more than like 20 words on the slide. I broke that rule here, but it's good information. And this this PowerPoint will get posted. Uh, I'll post it in the comments when I'm done. Um, so you can re re review it at your pleasure. Um, I will update my notes because I'm missing some notes. So, uh, so you see there's three major dynasties of, of the Scythians. Um, I have a problem with this timeline. And if uh, anybody does quick math, you'll notice that, it's, that some of the timelines are backwards. But the first dynasty technically occurred before the second dynasty. Um, so we have to sort of, uh, again, take this as a grain of salt. We're basing, um, and this, this came out of Barry Kuhnlis' book, so i got to do some more research about why the, the, the numbers are right. Um, I also occasionally misnumber things because I'm thinking it's all, I remember it's all BCE and not CE. Um, so it counts up, not down. But the first dynasty occurring 675 to 660, uh, you know, that, those, those kings come in that region, uh, whereas the second dynasty came in the 7th century. That would be before, so I'm not I'm, I'm not real clear on that. But uh, so these are all some of the some of the kings we know of. Uh, early ones are known because this is when uh, Herodotus was around. We have the second, third dynasty are the ones we know the most about because that's when Herodotus was there in writing. You see the uh, IV seventy six and IV seventy eight is when we get the references from. Uh, before that, I think the first dynasty maybe he was basing that off of conjecture and people he heard of, um, and then inv individual rulers after that were were sort of uh, post. Third dynasty, we see a couple there um, with some anonymous names. So we know that we, we know they were rulers because we they they were mentioned and were not named as one of the other ones. Um, so we're guessing that they were rulers that were either um, extras or just not a uh, not named specifically or, or weren't you know this is later in period so there may not have been enough. Um, there, there, were, there was not enough renown of them. Um, you're talking about a, about a 400 year difference, uh, give or take. All right, some major events. Uh, again, this also comes directly out of Kunlif's uh, book. Uh, so I just I copy this directly in just so we can kind of talk about it. Um, so we're talking roughly 800 BC. So there's a, let me actually grab that book. Nope. Oh, there it is. Uh, so there's three, uh, or there's four or five different regions that it talks about. Um, so PE is Peninsular Europe. Uh, PS is the Pontic Steppe. Um, AS is the Asiatic. Do we do something or other? The Alt Altai Sion um, region. Trying to find that, that timeline now. Here we go. Um, so I'm sorry. So AM is Asia Minor. Uh, yeah, so AS is Altai Sion, and then you have a CA or C, Central Asia or China. Uh, all right, so again, I'm not going to go through these, but a couple of uh, big points here. Um, so you see predatory nomads from the Altai Sion move um, into Scythia. Uh, so this is the Chimerians or Chimerians. And you have new bands of, of, of nomads or Scythians arriving and driving out the Chimerians. So this is when sort of Scythia is established, is that 900, 800 BC. Um, 
it shows where the, the, the Chimera is moving around in the Asia Minor region. And you see Arzan 1, who was one of the kings mentioned um, in the Altai Sion. Um, in 700, Scythians moved into Transylvania in the Greater Hungarian Plain. So there's a group that moved across the Caucasus Mountains into Hungary uh, and into Transylvania. We don't know if they ever came back or not. Um, I, I, I posit they, they didn't and they stayed there and, and there was some trade established and some of them probably came when it went, came and went, but a lot of them were there. Um, you see some early Kurgans uh, being established in Kelimaris uh, and Olsekel. Um, and Scythian can, is, Scythians take control of the Pontic Steppe. Um, there's some kings marrying people there, marrying their daughters off, which uh, the thing that just happens. Or, and again, we're basing this off Greek culture, so maybe not. Um, and then Arzan II uh, is king in the Altai Sion. Well, uh, moving into the 600s, um, so Scythian philosopher Anarchus in Athens. Well, we don't have a whole lot from him, uh, and, and i got to find some better sources for it. He's mentioned a couple times, uh, but not enough to say that he's a, a, um, a reputable source. Like, there's not a, he doesn't have a good, enough good writing. And so I'm doing some looking. You may out there knows of these things. Please send me links. Send me stuff. What? Send me. Send me what you got. Um, the Scythians here meeting the king of Sparta. This is important because there's some paintings of that, um, and it's one of the paintings you see with it with them with their tall hats. Um, I think I think it's just cool because again I love hats. Um, so Darius uh, campaigns across the Pontic Steppe. One of the first time they were pushed in, uh, tried to try to push out of the Pontic Steppe, um, and Scythians pushed back. Um, some more wars down there. Um, it's in a war, I think, it's actually cool, led by a queen, so that's kind of cool. Um, and you see a Sokka. Um, so Darius not only campaigned against the, the Scythians, he also campaigned against Sokka, um, which were different people, but often grouped together. He probably actually, he, he, he may not have even known he was fighting different people. He may have just saw him dudes with horses and probably just kept fighting them. Uh, moving into 500s, uh, the Persians attacked Greece. Um, Scythian mercenaries actually fought with Persia because of where they were. Um, the idea being that if the Greeks took over the Greeks took over Persia, then it gives them a better uh, uh, launching point into um, into the Scythian into the Pontic Steppe. Um, so I, I would assume they they sided with Persia in that. But because it was not a unified people, it was considered mercenary work. Uh, you see the Peloponnesian War uh, from four thirty one to four hundred four. Um, and then some, some new creation of the kingdoms. Uh, Spartacus, the king leader of the Bosporan state. And then uh, Sarmita, crossing the Volga in the Scythian territory. Um, important uh, sort of, I guess, note there. <clears throat> All right. Um, All right, so Scythians involved in the Bosporan succession. Um, so, and then uh, Zoprian besieges Olbia. So those, those are two sort of major things in the 400s. And then in Asia Minor, Alexander conquers. So this is this is where the, the sort of the fall of Scythian Empire starts um, or ends, who you would talk to. Um, I definitely look, look that it's further. That there is, because Scythia was not a singular group of people, um, even though Alexander conquered in the 300s, there were still people out there that were Scythians. There were Scythians around. They were just as Scythian as they were before he came in. Um, but th them as a powerhouse in the area was uh, very much ended there. Um, the uh, the Kol Oba burial, um, which is one of the, I think, bigger ones. Uh, there's some cool stuff coming out that came out of Kol I uh, was in 300. And so the Celts actually appear on the Pontic step. So there is some Pontic, uh, some Scythian Celtic connection as well. Um, See in 300 as well, you have Pazirak, um, Pazirak Kurgan, uh, established there. Um, uh, to 110 to 80, uh, you have the Saka people settling into India. Uh, again, I think this is one of those when the Scythians or Saka went down, uh, fleeing Alexander, settling in that uh, that Indian, you know, Upper India region. Um, you see, you see some of the influence there as well. Um, there's also the, uh, from 133, going into China, which is the Scythians advancing across, uh, leaving their area, moving into China uh, against the, uh, into that, the, that culture in that region. And, you know, there were some fights, but also they just went, okay, well, it's looking enough. That's fine. All right. And I've always included this in my class, but you all know where to find me because you're already finding me here. So I will remove that. 
Uh, so yeah, that's it. Uh, that's what I got. Um, this has been a high level overview. Like I said, this is very much a uh, um, uh, air, air, airplane level. Um, wanted to just sort of get some information out there. I love the Scythians. Uh, I'm super excited. I'm, I'm wearing my Norse garb currently. This is what I've got, but I am working on a Scythian persona. Um, I'm going to talk about this at the beginning. I'll talk about it now. Uh, I dove into Scythians because we were in a talk uh, for some DEI stuff in the SCA uh, from actually from South Downs. And one of the points that was brought up by some of the people there that were the people of color, people of transgender, was that they wanted to see more uh, extra European personas being played by people in power. Um, and whereas I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a person in power. Um, I'm not a peer. I'm not a Royal. I'm not anybody, you know, I, I'm not anybody necessarily terribly important. I am somebody that's very visible. I am very large. I am very loud. Uh, my name literally means loud. Um, Guiler, not Gobbler. Um, but, uh, I'm also, I have a YouTube channel, so I have a voice. Um, and I, I am looking at the Scythians already, um, because, also, I'm sorry I'm bringing so much. My, my throat is killing me today. Um, Her Grace Sir Helga from the West um, turned me on to the Scythians because of the tattoos and because of the uh, some of their clothing. They have a, like a sleeveless tunic that was found at one point, and that's just a cool idea. Like, I want to do a sleeveless tunic because it's friggin' hot. It's all hell here in Mer Meridies. Um, so the idea of being able to have sleeveless tunics and not worry about wearing sleeves all the time was a, was a fun thing. Um, but that uh, that meeting uh, from South Downs really made me dig into the um, um, the culture a little more. Not a serious question, but what do you believe was the significance about Scythian culture which gave rise to immortal warriors? See Highlander. Oh yeah, uh, that's actually that's actually a good question. Um, I don't know, Pike, but I'll look into that. Um, I would so old guard. I don't. I haven't watched all of Olgar. I need. I need to finish watching it. I, I got interrupted halfway through. I don't know that they were inspired by Scythians, but she happened to be a Scythian. So I think I don't, I don't know that Scythians inspired the Immortal Warrior. Um, I think she just the main character happens to be Scythian. I think they're disconnected. Uh, that's just a she was uh, Andromeda or whatever of Scythia. Um, however, giant flaming comma they did directly inspire Amazons. Um, so the the. Um, there is tale that the Scythian women warriors were the origin of the Amazon myth or the Amazonian myth uh, because they were female warriors. And, and I dare say probably one of the first female warriors. Eh, I don't know. Um, I see a lot of things that I may not be right on, but they were, uh, there are, there were talks and, and, and Kulik mentions it as well, that that was a, that could have been a significant uh, source for the, uh, the Amazonian myth. Uh, but I, I will actually look into that. I'll see if I can find. Uh, I'm gonna go watch. Uh, matter of fact, I'm gonna watch Old Guard today. I'm gonna stay in a Scythian mood um, and see if I see anything else out of that. And I'll, I'll look into that a little, a little further because it could be. And, and I, I think those stories are, are the coolest. Finding finding the myths and the the connection points is the one of my favorite parts. So, anywho, um, oh, uh, I guess I'm Virginia. Let's see. I think the Kurgan and Andy both have the benefit of being old enough and big enough that we don't have to worry about historians yelling at us. Yeah. Um, that's one of the reasons, I, one of the reasons I, I'm looking at the Scythians too, is that, uh, there's not a lot being studied about it in the SCA currently, and it's not Mongolian. Um, because when I try to do Mongolian in the area, man, I get, I get, uh, told I'm wrong. So I figured I would, uh, move off to Scythians and, uh, nobody would yell at me as much. So, uh, but yeah, but also because there's very little written about them, it's very difficult to tell me I have to, to, to prove right or wrong. Um, which I enjoy. I enjoy having conjecture. I enjoy being able to form my own opinion of a thing and, and sort of uh, piece in part uh, what the right answer is. And we're and because we're guessing, we're guessing based off of uh, you know stuff in graves and off of one dude's writing essentially. Um, so yeah. Anywho, I'm gonna sign off. Uh, this, is my, this is my second stream today. I am tired of talking. Um, and, and yes, like and I've, I've seen your messages. My phone is sitting here, and I've been I've been wondering what you're sending me. So thank you. I will look those up in a minute. <laughs> Um, this has been great guys. Thank you for the comments, uh, Fikin and, and Kayla and Jenny. Uh, you guys are awesome. I appreciate you guys showing up. And for those of you watching later, uh, enjoy this. If you have questions, please uh, feel free to PM me, uh, either on the channel or, um, uh, in, you know, if you, if you have me on Facebook also, please, please, please. If you're watching this on Facebook, go to my YouTube, 
subscribe, follow, like, all the things. I would love to get more subscribers out there so we can uh, build this channel up a little bit. Um, if you want to teach classes, please let me know. I would love to have more people teaching classes on this channel. I want to do more. So um, I'm here to help. I'm here to help give the SCA people a voice. Um, use my privilege for that. So anyway, uh, this has been Calberger on who were the Scythians in Calberger's Corner. Thanks, guys.